This commencement marks a milestone in the history of Hampshire College. Our sixth president, Jonathan Lash, is marking his own graduation of sorts, retiring after serving as head of Hampshire for seven years. And in doing so, he's observing his own commencement, beginning his next adventure on his life's path. Aren't you lucky to be sharing this day with him? <laughs> And now, Hampshire College's president, Jonathan Lash. Thank you. So here we are. It didn't start raining till you got in the tent. And it wouldn't have mattered if it had been pouring rain. It can't dampen us. This is a glorious day. I felt, I felt a special relationship with a class that started when I do, when I did, and I feel a special relationship with all of you. Um, mostly what I'm gonna say today is how much I love and admire you, but I got a few other things I need to do first. Okay, trustees, speakers, faculty, dean, staff, family, friends, a very, very warm and happy welcome to Hampshire's 48th commencement. Yeah. Whoa. So are we middle-aged? I, I, what does a middle-aged Hampshire look like? We began this two-day celebration yesterday afternoon Thank you, Jamila and Chris and Ava. Um, it was a, a nice, uh, a loving, a warm uh, event. We conclude this morning with an extended chance to celebrate the culmination of the college's year, your career here, and my career here. Those of you who are graduating got it figured out in four or five years. It took me a little bit longer um, but I did get to ring the bell last night. Yeah, I don't know where you all were. I rang it, my wife Ellie rang it, several trustees who graduated before there was a bell rang it, a couple of retiring, fa in fact we had a totally promiscuous festival of <laughs> ringing the bell, but everybody stayed fully clothed. Okay, as I said, I do want to talk about how much I love and admire you in just a moment. First, I want to recognize some people. I want to repeat something that, that Gay said. I want to recognize the parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts and siblings and friends, all of you who brought us this wonderful class and trusted Hampshire with the education of these students. I hope that you're as proud of these graduates as we are. Thank you for the sacrifices, the support, and the love that has made this moment possible. And to the Hampshire staff who offer support, who provide services, who create programs, who hold the place together all with amazing care and patience and an indefatigable sense of humor that I find remarkable and moving. Thank you. Thank you to the Hampshire faculty, the core of the enterprise, the great educational... Oh, I got lots to say about them, hold up. <laughs> the great educational philosopher Paulo Freire wrote that education occurs when a teacher risks an act of love. That is the wonderful gift to the Hampshire faculty. Hampshire faculty are here because they love to teach Hampshire students. They give of themselves to do it, creating a learning process built around you and your questions and your ideas and your concerns. I attended a great and venerable Ivy League university. And never in the four years that I was there did I have a one-on-one -on -one conversation 
with a professor about anything of substance, <laughs> let alone a shared exploration of ideas. The notion that student questions should shape the educational process would have seemed bizarre, preposterous. What do they know? But that's what we do. That's what makes this place so exciting. That's what happens at Hampshire. And it is indeed a great gift from the faculty, a true act of love. Could all the faculty and staff stand up? Just the devotion of all of you to our students, the love and support, the commitment to the idea of Hampshire inspires us. Now every year at commencement since I've been here, I've talked about the bell. You've each rung it. In fact, it's really one of Hampshire's only traditions. <laughs> and by the way, incoming President Nelson we really need to invent some new traditions. Maybe that could be a contest among the alumni <laughs> to think of things that in the future will be assumed. Because, you know, the bell was, it wasn't here always. It's only a 30-year tradition. Anyway, every time I hear the bell, even last night standing there ringing it myself, it makes me chuckle. For me, it's, it's a sweet sound. It punctuates the tempo of each Hampshire spring. It affirms the near miraculous courage, creativity, and independence with which you, like nearly five decades of Div 3s before you, have channeled your passion, harnessed your curiosity, and set off independently to explore something you cared deeply about, and in the process, discover how and where and why to learn, which is the most precious discovery of all. You have found your way, sometimes stumbling, sometimes inspired, through the obstacle course of Hampshire's inquiry-based, learner-driven, discipline-integrating in education. It's hard. It's supposed to be hard. And you did it. Amazing. You, you know that after this, if like two-thirds of Hampshire's alumni, you decide to go and get some more education in graduate school, it's going to seem easy. Because <laughs> you've done it all before. You have recruited and persuaded committees. You have designed curricula. You have imagined questions and wrestled with the maddening way that the search for answers only seems to deepen the questions. I saw a Wordsworth line that made me think of the remarkable process you pursue. He wrote, what we need is not the will to believe, but the wish to find out. Non sadescire, huh? That's you. Hopefully you've reflected. Surely you have clambered over conventional approaches and invented ways to turn your ideas into action. And that skill, it turns out, will stay with you and empower you. Not everyone has it. In fact, most people don't have it, but you do. In this era of disruption, you have the capacity for improvisation and reinvention. I've spent a lot of time in the last seven years with Hampshire alumni. Their stories seem always to be filled with unexpected leaps and abrupt turns and curious combinations adapting to change and opportunity. Where do you think they learned that? And you know it's not some weird, ex well, maybe it is eccentric, but it's also <laughs> in demand. 70% of you are going to end up in jobs that haven't been invented yet. In fact, being Hampshire graduates, many of you won't actually go out and get jobs. You will create them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I Your, your own organization, because you're concerned about something, your own gallery or 
social venture or business or a creative mashup of all of those that nobody's ever done before but you thought up. You're going to do it because you're fearless inventors. You're harnessers of disruption. Your time is now. One idea that I do hope you will take with you after this experience is something that Professor Chris Tinson and Javiera Benevente, the director of the Ethics and the Common Good Center, something they wrote about as democratic free speech. It's critical as a community that we uphold the right of every person to free speech and expression, including the right of nonviolent protest. They're essential rights, particularly in a community of learning. But what Javiera and Chris ask us to recognize is that free speech, while absolutely necessary, is not sufficient to support our goals of inquiry and justice. Free speech alone does not protect those whose voices have been ignored. Indeed, speech is often easier than dialogue, which requires listening and empathy, and can lead to understanding, growth, and change. We gain much nurturing the skills of active listening and reflection that sustain dialogue and enable learning it's something that I have seen Hampshire students do with incredible sensitivity and wisdom, and I hope you take with you from here. Okay, one more thing. You and I, right, we share the same challenge. What next? You may have plans, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I've mentioned to some of you that one plan is to become an opinionated curmudgeon which should come naturally, <laughs> but I don't think it'll be enough. So I'm gonna get re-engaged in climate issues, climate politics. I think I'll take the advice also of former Vermont Poet Laureate David Budbill. I don't know if any of you were here when he came to campus to speak of, on a panel on the arts and social change. He is an irascible man with a sharp tongue and an aversion to any form of sanctimony. And he wrote a poem called Three Goals that I plan to take to heart. This is a, a bit deep, rather spiritual, but worth thinking about. The first goal is to see the thing itself, in and for itself, to see it simply and clearly for what it is. No symbolism, please. The second goal is to see each individual thing as unified as one with all other 10,000 things. In this regard, a little wine helps a lot. <laughs> the third goal is to grasp the first and second goals, to see the universal and the particular simultaneously. Regarding this one, call me when you get it. <laughs> My friends, you can learn anything, you can invent what you need, you can build what you can imagine, you are the change, and therefore you thrive in a changing world. You've rung our bell, now ring the bells of society. Again, knowing you, I don't have to tell you that. You give me hope. Thank you. <laughs>